true pleasure for me to thank uh, uh, Gaël Chantrin, Stéphane Polis and Jean Winant for this opportunity to present aspects of my uh, past and current research on writing practices in the eastern desert of Egypt. During his early 20th century expedition through Egypt's central eastern desert, from the Nile Valley to the, the Red Sea, on the road leading from the ancient city of Coptos to the modern Kossir, French Egyptologist Raymond Veil wrote the, the following observations, which I have taken the liberty of, of translating for the occasion. We have only a dusting of observations that are not linked to each other and which, considered in isolation, are fragmentary and always imperfect. Thus, every, everything has to be studied, not studied again, even for localities like Amamat, where one might think, at first glance, that most of the epigraphic work has been, has been done. Apart from the locality of Hamamat, this road from Kossir, which crosses it, is at the same time of the great lines of the desert, the most neglected and the most unknown in the field of archaeological observations, and it is absolutely necessary to know it, its history in order to get an idea of the history of the vast desert which surrounds it. Although this part of the desert was central uh, in terms of both human dynamics and exploitation of mineral resources, this observation remains valid a century later for our still limited knowledge of the central eastern desert in the early days of its pharaonic and pre-pharaonic history, that is, before the New Kingdom, so the second half of the second millennium BCE. In the last decades, under the impulse of Hélène Cuvigny and Stephen Seidbosam, to name but two scholars, numerous missions have shed new light on the Greco-Roman remains of the Eastern Desert. Yet, exemp exem uh, exemplifying the project's urgency, the Wadi Amamad quarries uh, in the center of this region, although emblematic to historians, remain poorly known for their early history, although their hundreds of inscriptions and drawings testify active activities on site as from the second half of, this, uh, of the fifth million, millennium BCE. Beyond this, uh, this partial lack of knowledge, there is now a patrimonial emergency. In the desert, more than anywhere, anywhere else, growing human activities, threatened te testimonials from the past, making it more necessary than ever to rekindle its rich history. Focused on the, Wadi on the Old Kingdom epigraphic uh, material, the hundreds uh, and hundreds of testimonies that cover rock surfaces and quarries and along ancient roads, today's talk will uh, be based on both my doctoral thesis which proposes a, a novel approach to the Wadi Amamad Quarries epigraphic corpus, and on a current postdoctoral project that intends to expand this first work geographically and chronologically to consider Egypt's central eastern desert from the late 5th to the second millennium BCE. After a brief historical survey on how these desert inscriptions have been studied and how I suggest to approach this rich material, I will give you general views on all kingdom private and royal practices at Wadi Hamamat before broaching the central notion of inscriptional device, a notion I coined to refer to the strategy of displaying multiple inscriptions in one or more locations. Even partially, the vast majority of these inscriptions have been published, translated, and more or less commented since the time of the first modern explorers. Here, concerning the Wadi Amamat inscriptions, Lepsus, Kodenichev, and uh, Kouyamonte in the early 20th century. Until then, studied on the basis of reference publications, which extract which extracted them from their context, 
Desert inscriptions were largely exploited for their numerical data and other data useful to the writing of, to the writing of history, hence the appellations of procès verbaux, daybook, or even expeditions perished. Inscriptions were thus considered above all as abstract as abstract objects used rather than interpreted. For the Old Kingdom inscriptions from the Eastern Desert, Eichler's 1993 publication is a good example of the isolation in which the hundreds of rock inscriptions have been addressed, studied out of context and analyzed in the in the abstract for the, for the referential data rather than interpreted as artifacts that played mean a meaningful role in the context of their uh, desert location itself. Based on the Wadi Mamat material, my doctoral thesis proposes a novel heuristic approach for the analysis of these inscriptions by questioning the how, the question of the writing practices underlying these inscriptions artifacts. The aim was to shed light on the why, the question of pragmatics, that is the intelligibility of these investments, human and material, graphic and symbolic, in remote and liminal desert places. The approach adopted he here is based on the idea that the meanings conveyed by an inscription go beyond the pure denotation. First, by taking into account the material dimension of the inscriptions, I have, studied, I have studied the significance of their locations in the quarry landscape using, among others, uh, the notion of spatial dynamics. Second, by taking into account the visual dimension of the inscriptions, I have studied the graphic devices, that is, the ways in which the writing is staged, is staged sorry, on a given rock face, layout, and other visual sciences. And finally, third, uh, by taking into account the, the textual dimension of the inscriptions, I have studied the material, uh, uh, especially in light of the notion of intertextuality, as it turned out that on the scale of the site studied, the analysis of the relations that linked the inscriptions to each other uh, was particularly fruitful. Now, let's take the Wadi Amamat uh, corpus as a case study to uh, introduce several uh, Old Kingdom private and royal writing practices. These quarries are located halfway between the site, the, the, the site of Koptos and the modern Kossir on, on the Red Sea shore. It is uh, a six kilometer portion of this ancient road known as main communication axis and for its uh, geological resources. At Wadi Amamat, high ranking uh, expeditionary members such as expedition leaders, scribes or priests are the only ones to appropriate the rock faces during the first part of the Old Kingdom namely dynasties three to five. This kind of privatization of the quarry walls ends with the reign of King Pepi the uh, first from dynasty six, when the king floods, so to speak, uh, the Wadi's landscape with a marking of his own. The shortest intelligible mark is clearly the name itself, although uh, quite often, the dignitary um, claim his relation with the social group by adding uh, his titles. Through what, I, through what one may call inscriptional attraction following uh, John Darnell's uh, work, a large number of individuals engrave their name next to a foreigner's uh, inscription or next to colleagues during a joint graphic investment. Sorry. Uh, this is probably the case of these two Dynasty Five expedition leaders placed uh, next to each other. 
thus drawing each other into a kind of spatial and visual dialogue. Um, they illustrate perfectly uh, what some call spatial dynamics, a notion common in Greek epigraphy, where uh, it was coined as describing how inscriptional placement can be a vector of a different meaning. Here, spatial dynamics is to be understood as a form of social dynamics, in the sense that vicinity can sometimes induce sociability, either among members of uh, the same expedition or with distant uh, generational or intergenerational colleagues. In addition to uh, this first strategy, two others can be considered. The first concerns the commemoration of each individual's name. Here, Siahufu and uh, Kayaper, so the, the yellow boxes, uh, the first having his name at the bottom of his, of his inscription in a larger module, while the second has his name repeated twice. The second concerns uh, the celebration of a proximity with the royal sphere, so the second strategy I'm talking about. Let's have a look at the visual syntax of Kaya Per's inscription. The, uh, the upper part depicts, so to speak, the expedition leader Kayaper among his men, both his troops and the officials in his supervisors. The lower part's layout is also impressive in that it gathers elements with narrative potential that the visual level stages. Kayaper here is depicted in his relationship with his royal master, mentioned above, through his mission in every desert, which frames, uh, so to speak, this relation. Another hierarchical uh, relation puts the, uh, the expedition leader above his son, who was uh, probably a member of his father's mission. These different spatial, visual and linguistic levels partake uh, in staging individual social identity. And all these strategies are to be compared uh, with private Tom's iconographic and textual device in the Nile Valley, where similar self-presentation strategies can be observed. Along with private inscriptions, as from the reign of King uh, Pepi I, Royal markings are also to be found on the quarry's walls. I'm going to show you some of my interpretations uh, in terms of their pragmatics. At the time of Pepi I, an inscriptional device of six royal panels uh, uh, in one, uh, um, so, sorry, uh, uh, of six royal panels was displayed in one of the Wademamat main inscriptional areas. As a, a reminder, an inscriptional device is a notion which serves to uh, refer to the strategy of displaying multiple inscriptions in one and more locations. So this these six inscriptions include four which are non-figurative here A, B, D, and E, displaying royal names in various names in various ways, and two which are figurative here C and F, showing either the king before the god Min, the master of this very place, or the king seated on a double throne ceremonial uh, days covered with a canopy. Each of these panels mention uh, the first occasion of the set festival, this uh, highly ideological event during which the king, supposedly in the 30th year of his reign, celebrates his control over the entire world. When it comes to non-figurative uh, non royal panels, their spreading throughout the landscape aims at marking the place by projecting locally highly ideological graphic forms into this marginal space. The primal difference between non-figurative and figurative markings is about placement uh, in the landscape. 
Contrary to uh, the display strategy of non-figurative uh, panels, the two figurative panels are located in a specific area in a large fault, let's say, uh, at a height that makes them invisible from the main uh, circulation areas at ground level. This location mirrors a search for restricted access. Let me ex explain this idea. For instance, uh, this, figura this figuration illustrates uh, the coming uh, of King Pepe I uh, into the natural sanctuary of the god Min in the quarries. It has to be considered that this figuration, which falls within the realm of sacredness, pro probably required to be maintained far from other engravings and potential passersby. This distancing uh, phenomenon is clearly uh, illustrated uh, by Chechi's three uh, inscriptions. Chechi being uh, this uh, god seer who led an expedition during the late Old Kingdom. His personal uh, inscriptional device is special in that his uh, three uh, engravings are to be found just next to Dynasty, Dynasty Six. Uh, kings. So uh, here, next to Pepe the first figurative panel, here in direct proximity to Merenra's non figurative panel, and finally here in direct proximity to Pepe the first non figurative panel. Even if it had been possible in terms of available space, his inscription in the large fold isn't engraved in direct proximity uh, to Pepe the First figurative panel. This distance may be uh, understood through the three formal emic conditions of uh, sacredness according, according to uh, Egyptian thought. A sacred place or artifact is secret or hidden in Egyptian sicheta, reachable only by a select number of the chosen few, a place or artifact with a certain distance in Egyptian jezer to be maintained in order to preserve its state of purity in Egyptian wab. As illustrated here, there is a clear distinction between figurative and non-figurative uh, royal panels in terms of status. Highly, uh, highly sacred, the royal figuration has to be hidden in a distant, pure place uh, where rituals might have been performed. Now, I would like to look closer at this relation between royal inscriptions and the king's jubilee celebration. As I have said, every uh, royal panel of uh, King Pepe I is temporarily encored in the first occasion of the said festival. Uh, these uh, mentions do not implicate, uh, indicate, sorry, that the expedition was conducted on the occasion of the 30th year of the king's reign. They would rather, th they would rather uh, serve to integrate uh, the expedition commemorative in a, fixed, in a fictitious chronology of the reign. Encoring an expedition to the Jubilee celebrations might have served to illustrate the renewed capacity of the king to maintain his control over the liminal world, the uncontrolled world, let's say. Um, during this royal celebration, uh, the king's ritual run stages his capacity to have power over his whole territory, symbolically delimited uh, by Marker Cairns. The fact that royal expeditions were sent to the edge of the world uh, on this very occasion would imply that expeditions were understood as extensions of this ritual appropriation of the world. And following uh, this interpretation, the king's markings could be seen as is imprinting the landscape the signs of his passage 
at least symbolic in these remote spaces. This uh, leads me to fundamentally conceive all private and royal rock inscriptions as imprint, as imprints uh, in desert landscapes. The inscription imprint is part of a testimony, primarily of a passage, then secondarily uh, of an event or of all that marks the moment. So as to maintain a figurative memory, uh, to quote uh, the French semiotician uh, Jacques Fontanil. Now, during the third part of my talk, uh, I would like to focus on the notion of inscriptional device that I have already mentioned when talking about all kingdom writing practices at Wadi Mamat. A definitional overview is necessary here. The inscriptional device is about iteration of the writing act and dissemination of the name, royal or private. The inscriptional device um, is uh, this practice, which can, which can take uh, uh, different forms uh, and which is attested at all times uh, concerning private and uh, royal inscriptions. The, the, the graphic shown here tends to summarize uh, what an inscriptional device is. I here conceive a rock inscription as a semiotic ecosystem. So another notion I coined to refer to the material, graphic and situational environment initially devised to form a, co a coherent, functional and meaningful all implying a specific agentivity in terms of ostentation and uh, pragmatics, for instance. Thus, an inscriptional device is made up of at least two uh, semiotic ecosystems, themselves forming a functional, uh, sometimes multi-episodic or multimodal unity. As shown here, the notions uh, the notion offers up many angles for analysis, from the individuality of an inscription artifact to its, uh, situation, to its situational setting, and also to the overall staging strategy in one or more locations. As far as I currently know, if we co focus on all Kingdom private uh, inscriptional devices, are concerned uh, 43 individuals, 136 inscriptions, and 25 archaeological sites from north of Wadi Hammamat to uh, Lower Nubia. Private uh, inscriptional devices are equally represented in each period. Many of them uh, transcribe a local or regional uh, let's say, radius of action. To me, uh, this notion can be very useful as it gives the uh, opportunity to get out of the heuristic cul-de-sac mentioned earlier concerning the studied material. This descriptive and analytical tool makes it possible to consider these, uh, these writings uh, from the point of view of practices placing the uh, uh, inscriptional artifact in relation to the former actors, their dynamics of circulation, occupation, and investments of space, and the motivations behind them. I'm going to introduce you uh, to three specific case studies, which will respectively exemplify local, regional, or even uh, inter-regional inscriptional devices. First case study, uh, let's go back to the Wadi Mamad quarries, the starting point of my presentation. Kai's angle uh, is one example of a local inscriptional device. Four inscriptions were engraved uh, next to each other. 
the two inscriptions uh, given as an example show two, inscription, uh, two interesting aspects of uh, inscriptional devices. First, graphic variability, with here variations in modules. And second, denotative variability, with here variations in titles. So th these two elements may point to uh, successive investments, possibly during uh, successive expeditions. By graphically investing in a single place, in a single space, sorry, uh, this writing practice tends to, to appropriate uh, this uh, single space to create a place proper to commemorate one's name. The second case study uh, illustrates um, a regional inscriptional device, the one by Werbaupta, probably from Dynasty V. At uh, Wadi Amamat, he, engrave, uh, he engraved an inscription just next to those of Siarufu and Kayaper mentioned earlier. So here you have the picture. Uh, describing him as a personal scribe, scribe of the royal records, juridical sc royal scribe and royal instructor, scribe of the navy uh, of the navy recruits and scribe of the uh, expedition, where Baupta who does what his lord desires in foreign lands. Uh, the same surprising titles in an expedition context are also found about 25 kilometers east at a desert station on the way to the quarries. Here is uh, a new transcription of his second inscription, where he shows himself using similar titles of personal scribe of the royal records and juridical scribe of the royal council place. Um, in both cases, uh, despite several variations, its uh, self-presentation is quite similar as it stages a close relation with the real sphere. But there is more. Next to his desert station uh, inscription, there is an engraving, uh, perhaps related to the same Siarufu as the one at Wadi Amamat. Here, Special has to do with social dynamics, where both dignitaries, expedition colleagues, or are there inscriptions related to successive events uh, with the will to self commemorate next to the same predecessor? Uh, I don't have any answer, unfortunately, right now. Um, the four uh, inscriptions of uh, two related uh, dignitaries uh, and in two different places highlight the ancient itinerary they used to reach the quarries in both places as a, a kind of testimony, self-presentation and commemoration. They imprinted the landscape. Last but not least, the third case study is about the most extensive inscriptional device known to date. During Dynasty VI, a dignitary named Kayem Senu, and whose good name was Senu, engraved no less than 10 inscriptions in four different places in the Etfu in, uh, desert interland and in the uh, Aswan area revealing a, a regional and inter-regional radius uh, of action and commemoration. From one inscription to another, uh, the texts uh, vary and the writing differs epigraphically with various layouts and variations between hieroglyphic and cursive signs. When studied on both a micro or macro scale, all these inscriptions show a complex multi-episodic and multimodal unity. 
Multimodality can be observed when inscriptions complement each other. For example, one mentions is uh, um, sorry, one mention is good, is good name, another is affiliation with a funerary domain in Egyptian Perjet. Another one includes the king's name uh, Nefer Kara and uh, another that of his son. Um, multi episodicity is uh, particularly noteworthy uh, with these two well inscriptions at Birdunkash uh, and also at Birmuella, which tell of two successive episodes of creating well holes beside the inscription. And uh, for this uh, specific case study, a publication is uh, uh, underway, so uh, more to come soon. To sum up and uh, conclude, here was just a glimpse at my current research on writing practices in the Eastern Desert of Egypt, where I jointly analyze the graphic investments as well as the human dynamics of circulation, occupation, and physical and mental appropriation of these spaces by integrating archae landscape archaeology and anthropology with semiology and philology. One specificity of my project is to create a non-line database by joining the ERC-funded uh, Desert Networks project at LAS. You have here uh, a view on uh, the website, um, which uh, currently focuses on the uh, Eastern Desert in later times. It will gather, network, and specialize all the material available to help studying a complex corpus in all its diversity and spatial characteristics. Examining the writing in its spaces and the spacing uh, and the spaces of writing will certainly benefit holistic studies of desert spaces as well as the writing of an early history, let's say my early history of these uh, fringe spaces, from micro stories dealing with a given rock surface or a specific desert place, to macro stories when it comes to regional or even inter-regional dynamics. Rich are these spaces. They link several worlds, the ancient traveled, exploited, and inhabited, investing them materially, graphically, and symbolically. Thank you for your attention.